Swarm is a new Amazon Prime show brought to us by Janine Neighbors and Donald Glover, starring Dominique Fishback and a slew of other celebrities. If you clicked on this video, I think it's safe to say that you know the show is an allegory to Beyonce and the people that love her. Who's your favorite artist? But I had no idea how deep the connections would go because while some references may seem obvious, there's also a lot of small details that are easy to overlook. There is so much I could talk about for each episode, but I'm just going to go off and try to mention as many Easter eggs, themes, and theories I found interesting about the show overall. Welcome to Nyjah Nerd Yard. Spoilers ahead for the whole season. Leave a like and subscribe, and if I miss anything, let me know in the comments. Let me cover the basics. Episode 1 is brilliantly named Stung. We are introduced to Drea, played by Dom Fishback, as she is applying for a credit card so she can buy concert tickets to her favorite artist, Nyjah, the Swarm Universe's or Swarmiverse version of Beyonce. Nyjah's fans are called the Hive and they serve the Queen Bee. And anytime you start to hear bees in the background, get ready for some crazy shit to happen. But Drea is spending thousands of dollars as a surprise birthday gift for her sister Marissa, played by Chloe Bailey. We can tell that Drea definitely doesn't have the money for the tickets, but her obsession for Nyjah and need to connect with her sister compels her to get the tickets. From the jump, you can notice that Drea is a bit odd, and it seems that her sister is the only person that she is able to communicate with. And when she does communicate, it's almost exclusively about Nyjah. But the problem is that Marissa seems to be at a point in her own life that she doesn't want to always be with her sister, and she is dating this guy named Khaled, played by Damson Idris, and he's been getting in between the two of them while also being weird and trying to hook up with Drea at the same time. And we get this weird ass sex scene that everyone on Twitter has been posting about with Drea literally watching her sister get her back blown out. Even when the dude notices that Drea is watching, he just keeps on going. It's strange to say the least. But this all goes south very quickly because after an argument with Marissa, Drea admits that Khaled has been trying to cheat on her and also tries to take this time to cheer Marissa up with the concert tickets. However, Marissa doesn't want to accept that and tells Drea that she will actually be moving out soon and goes off to spend the night with Khaled. So this is the first time we see Drea dissociate and become someone else. She puts on makeup and her sister's clothes and she goes to a club to hook up with some random dude. So it's clear that her dissociation is caused by deep-rooted abandonment issues and we come to find out that a part of the reason she is so obsessed with Nyjah is because that's what she and her sister grew up with. And when they were younger, they made it their dream to eventually meet Nyjah in real life. In Drea's head, the only people People that have really cared for her were her sister and Nyjah. However, when Drea comes back to herself, she's in some random dude's bed played by Rory Culkin, and she has a bunch of texts from Marissa. Tragically, Marissa realized that Drea was telling the truth about her boyfriend and in a state of depression took her own life. This completely devastates Drea, and now really the only person in the world she can anchor herself to is Nyjah. And boy does she. She isn't even allowed to attend Marissa's funeral because we find out that Drea is actually Marissa's foster sister, but Drea's foster family disowned her for a situation I'll get into later in the video, but this just further solidifies that Drea has been through a lot and she's grown up in a system that let her fall through the cracks. Which leads us to today's sponsor, BetterHelp. Just kidding. But now, the only connection Drea has with Marissa is through her old phone, and Marissa's phone acts as the mechanism in which Drea dissociates herself. She starts texting herself as if it was Marissa texting her, and having a conversation about what actions need to be taken in order to fulfill their childhood dream of meeting Nyja. And look at that, the first order of business is to kill Khaled. And man, this is when I think I was in amazement and horrified by Dominique Fishback's performance because she's absolutely unleashing the wrath of 1000 bees on this guy. And she follows that up by immediately feasting on a pie over his dead body. Khaled is officially stung. Drea's face here kind of reminded me of Mia Goth's look, just very unsettling and disturbing unbridled insanity breaking through a veil of innocence. And the episode just ends there. So how much of this show is true? Contrary to the opening title cards for each episode, Swarm is a work of fiction. The title cards remind me of Fargo and are really just meant to mess with the audience and keep us guessing. However, the character of Drea is meant to be the culmination of crazy stand stories that have basis in reality. Co-creator of the show, Janine Neighbors, said that this was a direct reference to an internet rumor about a girl also named named Marissa Jackson that killed herself after listening to Beyonce's Lemonade album. Janine says that during that time she was on a text thread with some of her friends from Houston and for two days they thought it was a real rumor. So while the rumor of Marissa Jackson
Jackson was debunked, it served as the perfect catalyst for the show and inner conflict for Drea to deal with throughout the season. You may have noticed that there is original music made for the show and it is meant to resemble Beyonce's sound and actually a six song swarm EP is available on streaming under the artist named Nyjah. Chloe Bailey and her sister Hallie Bailey seen here at the Oscars looking like one knows your past and one knows your future. They're actually signed to Beyonce's record label Parkwood Entertainment. So that's a pretty awkward situation. And to be clear, Beyonce is aware of the project. She has seen the show, but I doubt that she's going to comment on it or give her opinion about her own fan base being portrayed like that. Okay, so now I'm going to just speed run through the rest of the season and just assume everyone has watched the show. Episode two is Honey, or what I would like to call the Paris Jackson stripper episode. And I can't believe those words just came out of my mouth, but it is straight up facts. In this episode, we see that Drea has become a stripper in order to get close to a guy that made fun of Marissa's death on Twitter, which we briefly saw screenshots of in the first episode. Dre is now going by the name of Carmen, which is also the name of Beyonce's acting debut movie, a hip hopera about a seductive aspiring actress who unwittingly causes trouble wherever she goes. The movie came out in 2000 with Beyonce playing the titular Carmen. Dre is befriended by Paris Jackson's character who is also a stripper, and she's just trying to be friends with Dre while she's working out drama with her boyfriend. I actually had no idea this was Paris Jackson until after the episode, so her walking up with the baby hair saying that her dad is black is actually crazy. You're black? Yeah, my dad's half. Half what? And Paris's stage name is Halsey, who is also what you may call a white passing biracial person or whatever you want to call it these days. Yeah, that's why my stage name's Halsey. You do know who Halsey is, right? To be honest, I've never heard one Halsey song, so I really don't get the reference. Hey, sir. Who's Halsey? I'm pretty sure Paris Jackson's boyfriend is driving what's supposed to look like the Kill Bill pussy wagon. It also features in a Beyonce Lady Gaga music video. It could be a reach, but it seems on brand for this episode in particular. Andrea kills both of them for what seems like just a means to not have to associate with anyone. She does end up finding the guy she's looking for and orchestrates a way to kill him. And the show manages to subvert the scene and makes it so much more terrifying. Who's your favorite artist? Cody Blaze has a total of one Grammy. Naja has 26. <laughs> you think Cody Blaze is better than Naja? You said she could die tomorrow and you wouldn't miss one song. Laugh an emoji. When she escapes that situation, we see that now when she's texting Marissa, there's typing bubbles appearing even while she is holding onto her phone, which I believe is meant to show that we are now seeing things through Drea's eyes and she really believes she is receiving texts from Marissa. It's very creepy. So I guess in this episode, Drea learns you catch more flies with honey. Episode three is Taste or the Jay-Z episode. This episode starts off crazy for me because Drea kills a YouTuber that gave a dumb take on Nyjah. Like, damn, should I even be making this video? Then why did you say she couldn't keep a man happy? And I got the receipts. Nigga. Twitter. The scene is really reminding me of Misery with Kathy Bates, who also plays an over-obsessed fan. Darling, trust me. God. There's a lot of references to the Beyonce Jay-Z elevator video. The Swarmiverse version of Jay-Z is Cache, respectively Nyjah's husband. Cache is currently on the first last tour. FL colon T is a clear reference to Jay's 444 album. And I think the first last tour might be a reference to how Jay-Z retired after the Black album, but then just unretired and started making music again. But I like how they lined up the tour dates and cities exactly to the 444 tour schedule. And Cache is actually played by Steven Glover, and you may already know that Steven also does all the vocals for Paperboy's music in Atlanta. Drea is on the hunt for her next hater, and I thought it was absolutely hilarious how she was able to move forward with her plan because someone mistook her as a different black girl. This whole scene seems to be born out of an Atlanta episode. Is this woman being racist? She's with me. Drea meets this guy and starts going by the name Shanice, and she really played my guy dirty. He was really just out here trying to get his life together, but he puts it all on the line for some cake. I am still a bit confused by Drea's obsession with junk food. I think it may be an anxious coping mechanism, but let me know in the comments if you have any theories on that. Drea manages to get into the concert after party where Nyjah will be attending, and some guy walks up to her saying that he's an actor on Grey's Anatomy and the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, which means it could only be Jesse Williams, but why though? I have no idea. 
I'm Jesse. I'm, I'm an actor on Grey's Anatomy. So Drea spots Nyjah at the party and we get this extremely weird scene where Drea believes that she is biting into a plum, but in actuality she was biting into Nyjah. Well, did you just bite Nyjah? And this is something that apparently happened to Beyonce in real life. It was very unclear who bit her until Tiffany Haddish of all people revealed that it was Sanaya Lathan. However, Sanaya has denied the accusation, so the world may never know who bit Beyonce, but we for sure know who bit Nyjia. But it's a deep reference because when Drea runs out of the party, one dude mistakes her for the chick from Love and Basketball. You know that was? Chick from Love and Basketball. So in this episode, Drea learns that you can't have your cake and taste it too. Episode 4 is Running Scared or the Billie Eilish Get Out episode. The episode title is also the name of Nyjah's concert tour and also play off of Beyonce and Jay-Z's On The Run tour. Drea is on the run after her little bite and ironically, the Storm is now actively trying to find her. Becky with the big teeth? Finna get stung. However, Drea has a plan to follow Nyjah to Bonnaroo where she will be performing the last night. But when Drea is befriended by a cult of white girls led by Billie Eilish, she is compelled to stay a while as they try to induct her into their group. Drea goes by the name of Kayla in this episode. This is actually Billy's acting debut and I gotta admit it was a good role for her. Billy's music videos are already pretty weird and creepy so I think they casted her perfectly for this one. I think there is a big nod to get out in this episode with the hypnosis scenes which is one of the creepiest scenes of the series. They got these close-ups, quick cuts, and sound design. It really felt hypnotic. Name. Kayla. Name. Dre. Very good. Whoever did the editing for these scenes is incredible. It does seem like Drea is actually about to have some type of breakthrough in this episode because she relinquishes her phone and reveals her real name to someone for the first time in a long time. We even get some clues to Drea's background. Her first memory of listening to Nyja is at her grandmother's house where she spilt some milk. However, the milk was red, implying that from a young age, Drea has been prone to violent outbursts. What color was the milk? A further implication is that she may have even killed or stabbed her grandmother or someone in her family, which might be the reason she ended up in foster care. And then guess what? Oh, I really liked it. It made me happy. This episode is basically an indoctrination into a cult under the guise that they are trying to help, but really they don't want to help Drea with her Nyjah obsession as much as they want to shift that obsession to their own cult or movement. If you leave, you know it. Drea runs Billy over with her car. That windshield wiper kill scene was pretty great. One windshield wiper going on one half of the screen as her arm is raising, making strikes on the other. Never seen that before and it's pretty cool how they implemented it. Drea doesn't end up making it to the concert in time and cries herself to sleep in her car. And in this episode, Drea learned how to take down the bad guy. Episode five is Girl By or the Malia episode. I just think it's cool that Malia Obama helped write this episode and helped write some scenes on the show. It's pretty hardcore given this episode's subject matter, like what's on your mind, Obama? So Drea isn't able to turn Marissa's phone back on, and when she tries to get it fixed, she finds out that her foster father turned off access to it. We find out that Drea is back in Houston where she runs into an old friend and gives this fake story about how she is now doing makeup for Nyjah's mom, and I think we're meant to take this as what Drea imagines Marissa would be doing in her life. Super sad, but also very scary how she is able to just switch it up really quick and act like it's all true. Dom Fishback is a legend for how she is flexing this character every damn episode. Episode. But Drea is able to sneak into her foster family's home and they have some money which really shows us how committed Marissa would have been to staying by Drea's side because they were clearly going broke together when it seems like Marissa always had the option to mooch off her parents. But the foster parents really blame Drea for everything that happened with Marissa and that's the reason she wasn't allowed at the funeral and it turns out that they never really wanted to take her in in the first place. She was kind of just a check. There you were, a check at the front door. Taking that money was the biggest mistake I ever made. They say at your highest moments, that's when the devil comes for you. What they don't tell you is at your lowest, he's already motherfucking there. While Drea is running away from her foster dad, she locks herself in Marissa's old room. Little shining reference here, I swear. And I think when she sees all the makeup kits, Nyjah's posters, and the photo of Marissa, a piece of her just kind of breaks. She stares into the mirror and really has to confront herself a bit, and she doesn't have access to the phone anymore, and she can't stay up to date with all of the Nyjah news to plan her next move. Drea jumps out of the window, and we don't see her land, but the sound it makes when she hits the ground is catastrophic. Get the fuck home. 
episode 6 has fallen through the cracks or the first 48 episode this episode is a complete departure from the rest of the season it's a documentary about a detective trying to find drea very meta because it implies that we are watching the dramatized show about the true events that happened in the swarm reverse of madness there's even a plug for swarm at the end of this episode you're directing i'm directing this show that I'm working on right now with like a Chloe and Damson and Dom Fishback. It's in the works, it's going well. I love how the detective was able to identify this suspect as a black female serial killer by details left around a crime scene. I had to find out who else this bee had stung. <laughs> That was good, right? Make sure you keep that in there. And you notice that they bleep out Nyjah's name so you can basically just replace it with Beyonce's in your head. Was he a fan? Huh? Was he into Did he love her or hate her? And the high fans even wear outfits resembling Beyonce's Ivy Park clothing brand. And we get confirmation that when Drea says she spilt the milk, that means she stabbed or tried to kill someone. I didn't even realize I got stabbed until they got her off of me. Now, Andrea, she just said she was sorry she spilled the milk. Now, if this episode is to be believed as the true events of the Swarmiverse, it also provides important details regarding the end of the series. Hey, what's up? It's Editing9 here. I actually realized that I forgot to include that they have a tip line. So if you want to call in and give tips on where Drea might be, you can do that. So I'm actually going to call the number now um, and see what it says. You reach the number of the police tip hotline. If you have seen or have any information on the whereabouts of Andrea Green, please enter the crime reference number A5. Who's your favorite artist? Who is your favorite artist? <laughs> and it just sounds like that. So yeah, if you call the number there, you just get a little uh, Easter egg which I think is pretty great. Episode seven is Only God Makes Happy Endings, or the Tony episode. In this episode, Drea finds love and seems to actually be adjusting to a new life. She goes a year with someone that doesn't even like Nyjah. Her new girlfriend, Rashida, is played by Kiersey Clements. Kiersey has been in a lot of different stuff, but I was most excited to see her more as Iris West in the DCEU, but you know how that's going right now. Drea has completely changed her look in this episode and is now going by the name of Tony. I think Tony is another dissociated actor aspect of Drea's personality that has taken control since she lost access to Marissa's phone. Drea meets Rashida's parents and it's Cree Summers. Cree also made an appearance in the final episode of Atlanta titled It Was All a Dream, which actually has a strange parallel to this episode in concept and ending. Cree Summers could even possibly be playing the same character in both shows considering that this episode is set in Atlanta, but that's a theory for another video. There is such a strange dynamic in this episode because Drea is actually being accepted into a loving family, but she's also on the run and the cops are on her ass. So really, she can't have a phone or get an ID or really be out in public like that. So it's not like she can just restart her life, she's just in too deep at this point. So a year passes and Drea makes a move that parallels her actions in the beginning where even though she can't afford Nyjah tickets, she spends $4,000 buying front row tickets for her and Rashida for their anniversary. Even though she knows that Rashida doesn't like Nyjah and has been taking care of all of the expenses you wanted me to enjoy myself. At least take me to see her sister. But this is when the Tony facade breaks and Drea goes back to her old mission of doing whatever she can to meet Nyjah. So at the end, we get another dissociated scene where Drea imagines that she calmly got on the stage and was embraced by Nyjah. But it's clearly an hallucination because Nyjah has Marissa's face. To me, this is confirming that Drea's true obsession wasn't really with Nyjah, but more of an obsession with the feeling of being loved and a quasi-sacred bond with someone that always had her back. And in episode 6, in that documentary episode, we know that she was caught on stage and was probably taken to the back of a cop car. I'm gonna go down to Atlanta, see if I can talk to her. I told them to hold her. Hopefully she doesn't make bail before I get there. Paparazzi were most likely trying to take her picture and figure out who it was that rushed on stage. But in her mind, she is being escorted with Nyja as a form of wish fulfillment. And I think this line of thinking is further supported by the way that Nyja is always used in terms of being a god or goddess. No, no, no. Nyja is a queen. Nyja is a god. Nyja is our sister. She is not like everybody else. She knows what we're thinking and she gives it a name. She's a goddess. But in the Billy episode, Drea says that she believes God is just an echo. Because I realized it was just an echo. What was? God. 
Through this parasocial relationship that Drea has formed with Nyja, or her quote unquote goddess, Drea has just really been using that as a reflection or echo of herself and who she aspired to be like. When she imagines herself eating that apple or plum in episode 3, she was actually taking a bite out of this forbidden fruit in order to achieve that sense of godliness, taking a bite out of Nyja. But yeah, that's just how I took the ending and the themes of the series. I honestly really like this show and the time spent with all of the characters. With only seven episodes, it's easy breezy to get through, and I feel like it's a very solid watch. And understandably, I get if it's not for everyone, especially if they were put off by the documentary episode that kind of diverted from the main plot. But for me, I love the whole style and flavor of the show. I think we're only going to get one season of the show. I have no idea how they would continue the concept after this episode, unless they deal with a whole different fan group and different characters. But who knows, maybe there will be a season two. Please let me know what you think of the ending and the series overall. I've seen some interesting takes on this show. Some people really hate it and that's kind of surprising to me. I can't really pin down an exact reason why they hate it. I would definitely like to know what your reasoning for like hating it rather than just being like oh, it's all right. You know what I mean? But anyways, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe and I won't sting you.